Good evening. Welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible study of Bridgeway Baptist Church. I am excited to be back together once again and have an opportunity to open God's Word here in the middle of the week. It's it's almost like an oasis, isn't it? We have time to come together and see what God has for us right in the middle of the week. And this week is, is going to be a little special. We are doing something a little different today. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but Brother Graham Newton has been giving us a series of lessons on basic Bible truths. And he's talking about salvation and the beauty of salvation and how uh, we can know that we are saved. And so what we're going to do this evening, we are going to pull up Brother Newton's message from a couple of weeks ago. It's week number two that message that he gave, and we're going to look at that tonight, and and I'm praying that it will be a blessing. We have seen God move so mightily through this series, and we just believe that it would be a great blessing to you tonight. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then right after I get done praying, as soon as I say amen, we're going to go right in to the message by Brother Graham Newton. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for salvation that is only through the Lord Jesus Christ and that it is free for all. And we pray tonight, Lord, as we listen to this message by Brother Newton and we we see the things that are in your word about salvation. Oh Lord, how we pray that you would convict our hearts. We pray if there is one that is watching this tonight and listening, Oh, Holy Spirit, move in a mighty way. And may even tonight be the day of salvation for that lost soul. Now, thank you once again for this time together. We pray for our pastor and Miss Paulette, and we thank you for them. We thank you for the ministry that they have here and for the impact that they have had on our lives. We pray that you would be with them. We pray that you'd continue to strengthen them and give them added measures of mercy and grace and rest. Lord, be with Pastor as he leads the church and give him great wisdom and discernment as there are so many decisions to make and things to care for. I just pray that you would be with him. And and also for Miss Paulette, Lord, we thank you for her faithful service. Pray that you would continue to give her wisdom and understanding in the areas in which she leads and continue to be with her as she assists pastor in all the ways that she does. Now, thank you once again for this time, and we pray once again, Holy Spirit, speak through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Father, again, we want to thank you for your word, how we thank you that you've sent it to us, and that you've given your Holy Spirit to help us understand it. And Father, we just pray that the Spirit of God would teach us this morning. Lord, help us to hear your voice and embed truths in us that will enable us to be better witnesses for Christ. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just by way of um, catch-up, if you like, Brother... Uh, do we we have last week where we got to last week so basically what we were looking at last week is that the only way to see things correctly is to see them from God's perspective because man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the the heart right so if we're going to see things as God sees them We've got to see them through his word. But first of all, we have to know that his word is true. And we saw that we can tell it was true because of its construction, because of the way he's put it together with so many authors over so much period of time, because it doesn't have any errors in it, um, because of its prophecies, and it's a book of prophecy. You know, the, the, the rule for a prophet in the Old Testament is if you told a bad prophecy, you were uh, uh, dead and gone, right? You had one shot at it, but the Bible is completely accurate from beginning to end. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. 
Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, for instance, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, right? And we know that to be true. So that being the case, and I realize this is kind of condensed, the Bible being true, God's word says that there is going to be a judgment, that every one of us will stand before the judgment of Christ, that in Romans chapter 2, verse 2, that that judgment is according to what? Truth. And then John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So if we're going to be right for the test that God gives us at the end of our life, he's given us the questions and the answers. And we've got no excuse for getting it wrong. No reason, right? So we saw that, and this is important, that the way God divides people is he do, the people are divided into those who have no relationship with God and those who have a relationship with God. And what we're going to see this morning is six comparisons between those with a relationship and those without. Okay, There, there are heaps more that you could have, but these are just basic, um, basic comparisons that will help us to understand. The first is lost, right? And lost is a scriptural concept. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, which is the verse that will fall under that, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, right? The next term is the term saved. And our verse there in Ephesians, for by grace are ye saved, through faith and that not of yourselves. So there's the lost and there are the saved. And what we're going to do is these further contrasts that we have this morning are going to show us the difference between lost and saved. But what I want you to know is that those terms are directly from Scripture, lost and saved. They're not something that we've made up. They're what the Bible teaches. You either fall into one of those two categories this morning, right? So the first comparison that we're going to look at under that is the word condemned. Condemned is a legal term, right? When people break the law and are judged by the law, they are condemned by the law, if you like. Let's just uh, take a little example. Yesterday we drove through the... Um, the uh, Napier Taupo Highway, and all of us who live locally know that they pulled the, the, the speed limit down from what? 100 to 80, right? We tried not to have a lead foot yesterday morning as much as we could, but let's just say that we were trying our luck and we were doing 120 through the, through the Napier Taupo, and we got pulled over by the law, uh, by the, a police officer, essentially, the law says you can only go 80. So it would be the law that um, condemned us, if you like, uh, that, that we had offended against. And what we need to understand this morning is that every person alive or has ever lived has violated God's law. And God has seen each one. I, I haven't got a lot of time, so I won't give you another illustration this morning. But everybody who is born in this life finds themselves in that condition. So there's the condemned. And the verse for condemned is John 3.18, which says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is what? Condemned, condemned already judged by the law because they have not believed, right? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So let's move over to the next term. And uh, like I say, we are moving just a little bit and shaking. So if you need to breathe or something, just put your hand up and I'll take a breath too. But um, the second term is the term justified, right? And justified is also a legal term. And justified uh, 
People who have no offence against the law are in a just position before God. Right? So we've got another verse there, and this is a goodie. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, which says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So let me quickly illustrate this. I've sped through the, um, the uh, Napier Taupo Highway. I've gone 120. I've shown a bad attitude to the police officer, and he's arrested me and given me a ticket. And uh, I get taken back to the police station, and uh, somebody pops in and says, you know what, I want to pay your fine. Okay, so he pays the fine that I have earned. That offence then is covered, and I am now in a just position before the law because that condemnation has been dealt with by another. Now let me ask you a question. Did I break the law? Yes, yes I did. Was I guilty? Yes. yes. I had offended against the law, yet somebody had taken care of that offence and paid it on my behalf. So I stand justified even though I'm guilty as sin. Does that make sense? Isn't that cool? So what we've got to understand this morning is that those who are justified spiritually are not people who have never sinned. They're not people who have sinned less than other people. They are people who, having believed on Christ, he has paid the penalty of their account and they stand justified before him. The law has no claim on them. Okay, so these are... Lots of people think that it's a, a conduct thing, right? That you have to do good or you have to do better than others. And it, you know what I'm talking about. I was thinking the only scales in the Bible are fish scales. <laughs> There's... There's no, none of that type of scale in the Bible. But we're going to move on for time's sake. So we've, everyone understand, condemned, justified. Let's move on. The next term is for, unforgiven. All right? And that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Acts chapter 13, verses 38 through 39. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are what? Justified. Justified from all things which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. What's it through? Belief. What do you receive? Forgiveness of sins. Okay, so again, those people who are in the first column are there not because they're worse than you and me. They're there because they have not received forgiveness of sins. That's what it is. Um, so when we look across, the other word there is forgiven. Forgiven. And the verse there is Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Grace. Okay, it's not, our, it's not our merit, it's not our bank account, <laughs> it's not any of those things. You, you have probably, if you've been around a while, you may have seen the bumper sticker, I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Listen, that's true. If you haven't learned it yet as a Christian, that's true. But it's not an excuse either, eh? It's not an excuse. So, interesting. Let's move on. Okay? Let's move on to the word unrighteous. So, uh, the literal meaning of unrighteous is not to be righteous with God. We're not talking about those who you and I may think are unrighteous. 
We're, we're talking about those whom God does not uh, hold to be righteous with him. And we're going to build on this as we go, as we look at the next word, which is righteous. Righteous. And this verse is a powerful verse for us. We're going to read it. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've got your underliner in your Bible, this is where you need to use it. And I'll try not to cut out the projector there. Unto all and upon all them that believe. Unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. How many of you like steak? <laughs> okay. Oh, no steak. Okay. Here we go. Let's just imagine that Havelock North was giving away five kilos of porter. I like porterhouse steak. Okay. Let's say they were giving away five kilos of porterhouse steak free. That offer would be unto all. And there are some who would go and they would take up that offer and receive that stake and it would be upon them because they had made that offer their own. Right? So, just the same, I mean, there are some probably wouldn't claim it. There are some who would disbelieve the offer. There were some who would think it was last week's steak they were trying to get rid of. There, was, there are some who think, man, I'd like to take up that offer, but I just can't get there. There are some who would see the long lines out the door waiting for steak and be put off by the long lines. But just the same, the offer of salvation and uh, righteousness and justification and all of these things is unto all. Yeah. Unto all. Yeah. But it's only upon those who take it for themselves. That's it. Yeah. Only upon those. Um, and lots of people might have different reasons for not taking up that offer. Yeah, I just don't believe that Bible stuff. Or whatever the case may be. Oh, there's too many hypocrites in church. Oh, I'm meaning to get there. You've heard about those people. Oh, I'll get saved on my deathbed. Listen, you've got no guarantee that you're going to make your deathbed. You've got no guarantee of that. So what righteousness are we talking about here? We're talking about not the righteousness of man. We're talking about the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Therein is the what? Righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. What is the gospel? Let's, what? what? The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. That's the gospel. Nothing more, nothing less. Jesus died for me, he was buried for me, and he rose again for me. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, on the tree. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us why he had to. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are dependent on the gospel. There's no way we could save ourselves. For when we were um, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible tells us, and this is cool, 
the righteousness of God. Abraham received the righteousness of God. How? And Romans chapter 4, it says, And Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was, what's the word? Counted. Accounted to him. Counted to him for righteousness. You know, you know what that word counted is an accounting term. It means that God, through believing on the Lord, takes the, the righteousness of Christ and adds it to the account of somebody who believes in him by faith. Listen, there's been lots of righteous act in, acts in the world. There's been lots of wicked acts in the world. But let me tell you, there's no righteous act like when God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross and bear the sins of those who didn't know him so that they might be saved and have an eternity and glory. That's the righteousness of God in a nutshell. Okay, get my technology going here. Wow. Just imagine for a second, and this is La La Land, okay? <laughs> if, you know, if you know that, that terminology, someone comes to you who you've never worked for, never done anything for in your life, and they say, I'd like to give you $100,000. Really? Wow. So they walk you down to the bank, They've got a suitcase with them. They say, will that be cash? You know, I'd like to you know, pay this man $100,000. Will that be cash or check? And they put it on the counter and they open it up and they count it all up and it's put in your account that o only you have access to when you have the opportunity to draw from it. And you've done nothing for it. It's something that someone's done for you. Listen. God has given us infinitely much more than $100,000. It, it couldn't be put on an accountant sheet. Yeah. All because of his grace. Listen, it's not dependent on your conduct. It's dependent on whether you have been saved. It's whether you have been justified. It's whether you have been forgiven. It's got nothing to do with your conduct. The difference is all in that. Let's move on. Dead in trespasses and sins. We understand that? The reverse for that, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You have the quickened who were dead. L listen, we all know it means separated from God, right? That's essentially what it means is we have no relationship, no fellowship with God. But if I was to bring a corpse, not that I would here this morning, we put a corpse here on the ground, and I'm standing up on the corpse teaching you this morning. How many think the corpse would feel the weight of my, my, my stature and my girth? Not at all. Why? Because they're dead. Why do people not feel, you know, conviction from God? Why do they not feel the presence of God? Why do not they not understand all of these things? Because they're dead in trespasses and sins and it takes the Holy Spirit of God taking the word of God to their heart to bring them to life. And a supernatural thing happens then and I might be getting ahead of myself. Dead in trespasses and sins, eternal life. John chapter 5, verse 24, which says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into what? Condemnation. We've left that behind. Passed. Passed from death unto life. Guess what? When you're in column two, you can't go back to column one. You're passed from death to life. 
Next word is, the, well, for those who d- die in trespasses and sins, etern- no one likes to talk about this. Uh, it's not something we glory in. Eternity in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verses 14 through 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's not, it's not something we like to think about. Listen, you and I are either going to die in group one or we are going to die in group number two. There's no middle column for those who are thinking about it, right? Um, Agrippa was uh, uh, almost persuaded now to believe. Oh, you're almost persuaded? Just come on over. It's not like that. It's not like that. Psalm 917, wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Turn, if you will, to John chapter 3. Look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Is it because of how good they are? No. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You know, this, uh, let's go over to the next one, eternal life, and, and we've got heaven as the next one, John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Ye believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. We make our judgment calls on the external. God makes his judgment calls on the internal. And God only gives while we're alive for us to sort this out. While our little heart mechanism is doing its thing and we're breathing in and out, um, when we pass away, unless the Lord comes back before, God knows which, which column we're in and whether we'll go one place or the other. He knows. All right? So there is nothing that those who are in group one can do for themselves, and I say that for themselves, to transfer them from group one into group number two. Okay? Some people when they realize that they're not in great shape spiritually, they decide that they're going to do a few things. Um, First of all, what they do is they decide, well, uh, I know love's a good thing. Maybe I'll just be more loving to people. I'll help old ladies across the road and all of that sort of stuff. I'll, I'll do that. And then the next thing is they say, well, If I'm serious about God, I need to be baptized. Isn't baptism a good thing? Yeah, anyone serious about God might get baptized, so they might get baptized to try and sort that out. And then we have the next one, which is church. I probably ought to go to church if I'm going to be right with God. I probably need to worship. And then under that, we've got all of these things I might do, sing, give, pray, Maybe they even preach or take the Lord's table, all of these good... They've got to go into my positive account, don't they? Into my credit account, not my debt account. (laughs) Listen, so the problem with, with all of this 
is that it's not conduct that gets you into heaven. Okay? Let's just say, for hypothesis purposes, that there was somebody who was 100% good conduct. Just absolutely doing, you know, good conduct. And we know that there's not a just man upon earth who doeth good and sinneth not. So this is hypothesis, right? There's no one out there like that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, let's just say there was someone like that. Let's just illustrate this for you for a second so you can see um, the futility of this, if you like, for a moment. Okay, um, let's just say I was a multi-billionaire in my dreams. And I could pay people a thousand dollars a day to live like a Christian. They have to tithe on, you know, it'd have to be nine hundred dollars that they keep for themselves. They have to come to the church services. They have to pray. They have to do, you know, don't miss service or whatever the case may be. All of these things. And these people enter that conduct for that contract. Are those people going to heaven? Why not? Because they have not dealt with their relationship with God the right way. Right? Remember, he sees on the heart. He sees the heart. Uh, and listen, like I said, there's no such thing as scales. In the, it doesn't say if you're 51% good, you're going to get in doesn't say that at all. You can't find that anywhere. Okay? So, uh, it's interesting. The other thing that we could consider, just getting ready to close, is uh, Brother uh, Glenn Ray, let's say, how would you like, a f if I said to you, how would you like a Fijoa tree? And you say, man, yeah, I've been thinking about getting a Fijoa tree in my yard. That sounds like a good thing. I'll choose a place. You come over next Sunday and we'll get this Fijoa tree planted. So I come in and I, he takes me into the yard. I'd like this Fijoa tree right here. I said, that's cool. Let me just go to the car and I'll get some stuff and we'll, we'll be in good shape. So I come back with my shovel, I come back with something for the roots and all of that to, you know, to nourish them and so forth. And he sees me walking back and I've got this, these roots in my hand and I put these roots into the ground, right? I've, I've dug the hole, put the, the nutrition stuff in, put the roots in. Hold on, I'll just be back in a moment. I go to the car again and I come back with the trunk. So I add it to the, the roots and I put a little bit of tape around it and then the boy this is look, beginning to look pretty good then I go back to the car again and I've got branches so I you know I've got an arborist here he knows all, he knows all about what's happening so I, I attach these branches I tack them on to the tree and then I go and get some leaves and I get my stapler and I'm stapling leaves all over this tree. And I say, Brother Glen Ray, I could not give you a tree that's not producing. Right? So I go back to the car and I've got a bag of Fijoas. And I attach those to the branches. And man, this is looking like a great tree. It's looking like, are you happy with this tree, Glen Ray? He says, Brother Graham, there's something wrong. There's something missing. He says, it doesn't have life. It doesn't have life. How's that going to produce without life? And we live in a world where people tell you you've got to put this tree together and have all these things on the tree before God's going to accept you. You know, churches tell people that. And it's not true. It's not true. Trees without life don't produce. The starting place for you as a Christian is life. Let's look at a couple of verses here. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we've saw, we saw them before. 
For by grace are ye saved, and through faith, and that what? Say it. Not of yourselves. Don't you go stapling Fijoas to your tree and think it's going to please God. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Isaiah 64. But listen, if you don't understand that this is your address without Christ, there's something wrong. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind hath taken us away. And finally this morning, Romans 4, 5. It says this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. I'm going to throw in a freebie. 1 John 5 verse 11. He that hath the Son hath, and he that hath, the Son of, uh, hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's it, if I could say it, in a nutty shell. So just by way of closing this morning, this is what God says about salvation. What God says about salvation matters more than your opinion. It matters more than a church's opinion. It matters more than the Pope's opinion. It matters more than anyone's opinion. If a person... Let's just put that X in there, brother. If a person is in, number one, there is no way that they themselves can put themselves into number two. But doesn't mean they're without hope in that there is one who can. And next week, when we come together, we are going to look at what God has done for the lost world. So we're going to add some more to this chart. And it's a six-week chart, so what you're seeing is two weeks' worth of info right there. So it's going to get a little busier than it is now, but you will receive a completed copy when we have finished. Does anyone have any questions or about that? Oh, Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a love letter, that even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, you sent your Son into this world that he might quicken us together with Christ. We thank you that he was willing to pay the price and that our standing is changed forever through knowing him as our Lord and Saviour. Lord, just, we pray that whatever your spirit is doing in our hearts this morning, you would continue, that we would hear your voice and that we would be obedient to what you have for us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Well, amen. I truly believe and I'm, I'm praying that that was a blessing to you tonight. There's so many things in this message and in, in this series. Uh, we're going to have all of these messages up on our website very soon, and I know they'll be a great blessing to you if you know the Lord. But maybe you've watched this tonight and you've never trusted Christ as Savior. I want to encourage you, wherever you're watching this, whether it's on uh, Facebook or YouTube or our church's website, contact us through those outlets and tell us that you would like to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ and we will respond because that's the whole reason behind Bridgeway Baptist Church. We are a bridge that is connecting others to Jesus Christ. 
And that's our prayer through all of our messages, but especially through this message that you've seen tonight. Well, let's pray, and we're going to end our service for this evening. Heavenly Father, as we close out this service tonight, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and for all of these things that we've heard tonight. Lord, I pray that your word would not return void and that it would accomplish that which you have set it out to do, and that is the salvation of those that don't know you as Savior and the growing in the spirit of those of us that do know you. And I pray that those things would accomplish through all these things tonight. Thank you for this time. Bless it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a wonderful evening. May the Lord bless you, and Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday. Good night.